Well, Jesse Barfield joins us from St. John's, Newfoundland. And Jesse, we're going to get into it in just a second as to what brings you to St. John's. But I just want to follow up on something that Matt and I were talking about in our last segment and how the Blue Jays recently had a players-only meeting uh, when things weren't going well. Was that something that happened back in your days? And, and if it did, what, what was a players-only meeting like? Well, first off, we didn't have a ton of them. I mean, you can overdo it. Uh, the players basically policed themselves. But when we did have one, we knew it was necessary. You know, Bobby Cox was a type of manager that he wasn't shy. He's the type of guy that if something needs to be said to the players, he would say it. He would close those doors and and uh, tell us right to our face what we needed to hear. It was all for for the better. Did you guys ever have one without the manager and coaches, like players only? Without a doubt. Yeah, and, and who would be, like back then, Who what kind of guy would be the one that would speak up to the group? Would it would it be you? Would it be Shaker? I know George probably. <laughs> I don't know. I just can't <laughs> what would if George said? Uh, <laughs> well, you know what? It'd be a guy like Ernie Witt or Buck Martinez would call the meeting, and all of us would chime in. They were older than us, so, you know, I would take the lead of those guys and just follow suit. So – is it something where it gets heated, Jesse, or is this, is it fairly cool? I guess it would be depending on the personnel, but do things get sorted out? And is there any numbers correlation between the performance of the team before the players only meeting and then the performance of the team after the players meeting? Well, first off, there's no finger pointing. We were a close knit group of guys. We said what we had to say. We got it out in the open. We talked about it. It's just like family members. You know, you got to talk about things. And once you get it out there in the open, you may not agree on everything, but you know what? At least you discussed it. It didn't make a difference. You may not see results that night, but in the long haul, it's going to matter. It's going to make a big difference. And that's why you don't want to have too many because it becomes redundant and it, it's not it's not effective anymore. Well, Jesse, speaking of making a difference, this is my, my segue into what brings you to St. John's. And... I have uh, got a chance to watch a lot of your videos, uh, see a lot of your pictures online. And you're doing such a wonderful thing working with these kids. First and foremost, how much fun do you have teaching these young kids baseball? Well, I'm a young kid at heart anyway, so <laughs> it, uh, it's a lot of fun for me. Uh, the last group we had in Halifax, by far, was one of the best groups attitude-wise I've ever seen. Uh, they were very receptive. And I let the guys know that I really appreciated that. So the other guys. And when you have a group like that, it, it really makes you reach out even harder to help them because they're receptive and you want to give your all anyway. But those guys, I mean, I would stay during the lunch break and sit and talk to those guys and the parents and I would show them exactly what I was trying to, you know, really get across to those guys and make sure that the parents would be on the same page. It makes a difference. Jesse, when you were a kid growing up in Illinois, were you able to have, you know, someone teach you the way you're teaching kids right now? Or is that one of those things where, uh, you know, times have changed and you see a lot more of these camps now where you can get former pro players working with kids? You know, I made a comment. I'm glad you asked that question. I made a comment just the other day how I'm really glad that the kids and the parents understand how important it is and and, and the impact of what we're doing, because you, can, you can't get this everywhere. I mean, what we were done for something like this as a kid, you I mean, you have all-stars teaching these guys. You have guys, Hall of Famer, Robbie Alomar teaching these kids. And we all care. We're not just out here, you know, babysitting. We're, we actually care about these kids getting better. And they know that. That's why they're receptive. And we didn't have that growing up. Uh, I remember watching the Cubs and the, uh, and the White Sox. I had heroes on both teams, and uh, they said, you can't be a Cubs in the White Sox. Yeah, thing. what's with that? <laughs> I, I didn't care. Honestly, I didn't care about that. I had heroes on both teams. Uh, Kaminsky Park was actually my home because it was closer to where I lived. I never got to Wrigley Field as a kid. It was too far away. But uh, Dick Allen was one of my heroes. My main hero was Ernie Banks. I, I don't think that's a secret. I loved Ernie. And uh, – I finally got a chance to meet him. We were at a show together, and I'm getting on the elevator, and we're walking down the hall, and I said, Ernie, oh, man, it's a pleasure meeting you. I said, I just want to let you know you're, you're my hero growing up. I grew up in Joliet. He goes, I know all about you, Jess. How you doing? I said, man, he knows about me. That's crazy. That's got to be surreal, huh? 
Yeah, it have is. your hero said, say that to you? Yes, sir. I said, in fact, uh, I have baseball cards in my pocket to give away to the kids. And on the back of one of my cards, uh, my childhood hero, I, I grew up rooting for Ernie Banks. Wow. And he asked me to sign that card and give it to him. I said, you got to be kidding me. Wow. He ended up signing some uh, 8x10s for me. And I still have them in my trophy room. That's amazing. Now, I mean, thanks to your baseball career, you, you've been able to, to live a pretty decent life and, you know, take care of your family growing up. As a kid yourself, were you, did you have the same luxuries? Did you grow up in a, in a real difficult situation? What was it like for, for Jesse Barfield as a youngster? Well, we made a, a tough situation great. We didn't realize we didn't have certain things, but you know what? I owe my mom a lot of, a lot of credit because we didn't actually know we were poor. And, and I don't think we were. I mean, we didn't miss any meals, that's for sure. But uh, I grew up without a father. It's no secret. Uh, my mom was pregnant, and he ended up leaving her and married someone else. He broke her heart. And uh, I was actually told that that he was a friend of the family. That's how I was introduced to this, this gentleman. Wow. And uh, I found out in my 30s that you know, this guy was my real dad. It kind of, they kind of took me by surprise there. But I don't need a dad at thirty. You know no. what I mean? <laughs> did Did he but, come back looking for you once you know you had your career and he saw? Well, you know, now I got a chance to to get in with him. Was that Was that a situation? Yeah, it, it it was it was sort of like that. Yeah, That's I would a shame. say yes. But uh, the gentleman that stepped in and and started dating my mom at the time, uh, my mom was in love with my dad, but the gentleman that stepped in was was a heck of a man. He was my he was my dad. He's the one that uh that basically helped raise me and I was named after him, Jesse. Oh wow. Whoa. So then Jesse, as a father, do you how do you how do you father your sons if there wasn't a consistent father figure in your household? Well I had great people around me. I had great uncles. Uh, my high school coach was a great mentor. Uh, I had people around me that made sure that I straight on, I stayed on the straight and narrow, didn't stray away. Uh, I spent a lot of time at the Joliet Boys Club. I did my homework and I got down there. I wanted to play basketball, shoot pool, and swim. I just wanted to do activities and hang out with my buddies down there, and that kept me out of trouble. The uh, George Warden Buck Ball, uh, Boys Club, and that was my home, away from home, and uh, it w- it was a lifesaver for me. I tell you what, it happens with a lot of young kids that are faced with difficult times. They've got a decision to make, right? They can mm-hmm. either take the life of, of crime and, and go into to that and mix with the wrong crowd or do what you did. Uh, how much was this a conscious decision to say, no, I don't want to get messed up in that? And how much of it was just a product of maybe your mom? Well, a lot of it was her. She was a very positive influence in my life and my, my brothers and my sister, um, you know, she was a very strong person. And once my stepfather and her got, got divorced, which I was very happy about that at the time because they weren't a good match for each other. And uh, he left and he took both cars with him. He took the, he could have left the bad one, but he took that one too. Oh, <laughs> so we, we were terrible. carless. Yeah, that's all right. Hey, life happens, man. He took, uh, he took the hoopty as well. We call him the hoopty. So, we, uh, we were carless for a few years, and that was one of the factors in me signing in baseball instead of going to Bradley University. I wanted to get my mom a car. Oh, that is so sweet. Wow. So is that like your first paycheck, mom gets a car? Yeah, I, uh, I paid my taxes, and I bought her a brand-new uh, uh, T-Bird, Thunderbird. That's amazing. And, uh, you know, she, she was very, very grateful. That was our first nice car, and uh, it was hers. And... I bought my brothers and my sister a couple of things, some school school supplies and things like that. It wasn't a whole lot. It was seven thousand five hundred dollars, which was a lot of money back then. And uh, you know, I, I didn't spend any on me. I didn't care about that. I just I was so glad to get away and go play baseball. That's all I wanted to do. So I remember when my mom came up to Utica to visit. I was so homesick. I was so glad to see her. She drove me up to uh, Doltsville, New York, at the uh, Adirondack Bat Factory. And I went and, and they custom made some bats for me, like two dozen. And 
I love that Adirondack bat. I know a lot of people know I used that bat, and then Cooper came along. But I love that Adirondack. There's something about that wood. Louisville was good too, but Adirondack suited me. And I brought back two dozen bats. And man, I still remember that trip on the way back. I was like a kid at the candy store. Mom was like, "Hey, it's my." And she paid for the she paid for the bats for me. How old were you when that, this happened? I was 17. I got drafted as a young 17. I didn't turn 18 until October 29th. Wow. So then, Jesse, coming from these sorts of circumstances, does it give you some interesting insight when you're trying to, let's say, talk to the player, not necessarily coach them? Because I would imagine that a lot of coaching has to do with connecting with the personality versus actually talking with the athlete. Like, Do your circumstances, do they translate into offering insight into a young player that might be going through tough times? It does. And and one thing about coaching or, or, or being a mentor, the people around you that you're talking to and, and being there for, they have to know that you care about them. And and once you earn their respect and trust, you know, it, it's easy sailing after that. And they don't care about what you know. That it sounds like a cliche. They don't care about what you know until they know that you care. And and the thing about it is, you know, we all go through hard times. You know, I remember my mom um it was, it was rough there at one point where she lost her job. Uh, she was a seamstress at Hart Schaffner and Mark, and she was laid off. She, she ended up getting her job back. for one, But for one month, we needed a government assistant. Yeah, we were on food stamps. And I'm like, I was like embarrassed to go to the grocery store because all my buddies were there. And I'm like, man, I'm walking around like, <laughs> you know, letting them, letting them clear out the joint. And then I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is bad. So... I appreciate everything that, that I was blessed with because uh, I had to work hard for it and no one gave me anything. I had to go out and get it. And you definitely did that. And as a teenager, there had to have come a time when somebody discovered you or you discovered yourself and said, you know what, I, I can throw the ball a lot further than a lot of these kids and I can hit the ball a lot harder than a lot of these kids. When was When did it come to your realization that you definitely had – a little something there that was needed to actually do this for a living. You know, what's funny about that? A couple of my buddies, um, I didn't play organized baseball until I was 12. I didn't even like baseball. You were hoops, right? (laughs) Yeah. We all play basketball in Chicago. I mean, that's a, that's a Mecca for basketball and that's all I want to do was hoop. And uh, one of my buddies asked me to try out for little league baseball and he called me on a Monday, said, hey, man, we got tryouts at Belmont Little League this weekend. And and uh, I said, Rick, we, we don't have a car, man. I said, Dude, I'm coming by to pick you up. I said, yeah, I don't want to play baseball. So he calls me again Tuesday, no. Wednesday, Rick, no. Friday, Rick, okay already, I'll go. So <laughs> I went, and they, they put the number on my back. They pinned it on me. And and uh, you go to shortstop, get some grounders, throw a cross, and get the first, go to first base, pick a couple go to the outfield, some fly balls, test your arm out. Then you take BP. And uh, I get back home, and I get a call from uh, from Coach Hank Gowinda. And Hank goes, hey, congratulations. You're my first pick uh, for Eastside AC, air conditioning. Yeah, so, we, <laughs> we didn't, yeah, we didn't have any. Uh, we had brown uniforms. I still remember that. We didn't have any names like the Blue Jays and Cubs and all that. You know, it was, it was sponsor names. But uh, I was so happy. You know, I called my buddy Rick and I said, hey, Rick, did you uh, what team are you on? He goes, man, I didn't get picked. I said, hey, because the next day, the rest of the guys get picked. The first the first picks of the first day. So the next day I said, hey, Rick, what team are you on, man? He goes, dude, I didn't get picked. I said, oh, man, that, that stinks. So he would go to practice with me. And uh, a couple of guys didn't show up. And, and we we needed a third baseman. And. Uh, I said, Coach Hank, you know, Rick is not a bad ball player, and we need a third baseman. He said, you know what, I remember Shaw, and uh, Rick Shaw was his name. His real, his real name was Rick Shaw. So, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. <laughs> and he said, I remember Shaw. He said, he's you're right, he's not a bad ball player. I, I'll give him a uniform. So we ended up playing together in the same team in Little League. Then when we went on the Pony League, same team, same team in Coat League. We played together mm-hmm. in high school. He introduced me to the game, and the kid was so good-looking, man. I used to hang around him to get good-looking oh. chicks. Come on, Jess. 
You're pretty <laughs> handsome. You are a pretty handsome young man yourself with that uh, that mustache and, and the glowing hair. And, okay, now hold you know. up a second. You know what? Oh, Listen. Wait a minute. I want to hear something funny. I was just teasing Homer Bush is here. That's I oh, love that. Oh, oh man. All those guys, they're great. Homer Bush, we were in the dugout today, and uh, I said, what is this uh, uh, Ghostbusters thing you were, you were teasing me about on Twitter the other day? It's really said, good. What is that all about, It's man? really good. That? I said, I said, I said, I can see, I can see the resemblance. I said, it's more like uh, Billy D. And I said, let me tell you a funny story. We're in Milwaukee. My wife was with me. We're in Milwaukee and we're shopping. And then this person comes up to me, he said, can I have your autograph? And I said, sure. The lady, I said, sure. So I signed it, took my time signing it. And I put uh, Jesse Barfield, 1986 American League home run champion, 40 homers. And, uh, Gold glove winner, yada yada yada. She looked at it and ripped it up. <laughs> Jesse Garfield. She goes, "I thought you were Billy D. Williams." <laughs> My wife laughed so oh, hard. I could see that I though. I laughed for ten minutes. Oh, I thought that was the funniest man. thing in the world. She said, "I thought you were Billy D." She oh. ripped it up and threw it down. Hey, there are worse things that yeah, can man. happen. Uh, we, oh man, we we just chatted with John Gibbons on our show last week, and people are telling him he looks like Jack Nicholson. So <laughs> I'm thinking, I take what? I'll take Billy D. Williams over Jack Nicholson. I don't Nicholson. see that. I don't see that at all. <laughs> well, you see, there you go. You know, he looks better than Jack. Come on. <laughs> Yo, he does. He definitely does. <laughs> That, Jack's that, a heck of an actor, but uh, he's not the prettiest guy in the uh, world. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, ask, Homer, ask Homer Bush uh, how much he enjoyed playing for Jim Fregosi. Oh, You'll get a story man. from him there. That's great. Oh, I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, I, I was going to ask you, because we got on the topic of the facial hair. I have never seen a picture of you without some manner of glorious mustache. Now you're rocking the goatee. <laughs> what's what what's with the facial hair man like because is there well, are there photographs of jesse barfield with with no moule happening i actually i cut it about mm, a month ago i guess it was you know my wife said baby why don't you cut the goatee off i said why she said you're too cute with the goatee <laughs> <laughs> hey, you look too much oh, like billy d <laughs> yeah and i and to honor her we've been married 36 years and she's an amazing person i cut it off what? And she goes, you know what? Cool. I like your chin, and and I'm gonna keep it off for a while. Let let the face breathe. <laughs> hey, you know what? That that's that's the secret right there to a healthy marriage, right? If the wife no says doubt, shaving, she, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, you whatever the wife says, you do. That's if she it, says yes. shave your head bald, then yes, you shave dear. your head bald, yeah, right? Absolutely, it, you, absolutely you know, right. Bring it back to what you said about your mother, yeah. right? And and yep. you know. And, and your wife is, is a wonderful mother and, you know, they don't get enough credit for what they do and as well as, as being a wonderful wife. Exactly. So, hey, That's whatever right. she says. So it's one thing. We've had a lot of players on our show who are the sons of Major League players, right? And we, guys mm -hmm. like Biggio and Bichette. And, you know, they talk about all the, you know, advantages it was for them growing up to have a, a father that played in the majors. Now, as a father yourself with sons that are trying to be in the majors and working their way, what was that like? Was that pressure? Was that, you know, you're pushing hard for them, but you don't want to push too hard? You know, like, what was that experience like for you? Well, I made a lot of, a lot of suggestions to Josh and Jeremy. You know, I can't tell them what to do, but they understand that I've gone through a few things. I might know what I'm talking about here. So I remember when Josh mm -hmm. was in low A, um, that winter, he stayed at home forever. <laughs> and uh, in fact, and I'll, I'll, I'll back up to that story in just a second. I remember I'm watching the, when he got traded from uh, San Diego Padres in the big leagues, he, his, his rookie year, and then got traded to Cleveland right after that. And uh, he's at home plate. He's at home plate hitting, and, and he had to step out of the box. And, and both he, the catcher, all three, they were laughing. But anyway, after the game, I asked Justin, what happened there, man? He goes, I'm in the box digging in, getting ready. And the umpire looks at me and goes, Josh, are you still living at home with your dad mooching off of him? <laughs> <laughs> and, and was he? <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> He was That's in the big leagues, still living with me. Oh, He's like the cheapest person. My wife calls it frugal. I mean, she doesn't spend a penny. She's a military family. 
Josh drove the same car for 10 years. Okay, l- honest <laughs> honest question, Jesse. Do you still pay his phone bill? No. Okay. Okay. That, that, that's all right. No. As long as he's paying I his did own for a long time. Okay. But, you know, he's okay now. But uh in any event, you know, I, I make suggestions to those guys about hitting and all that and and Jeremy of course with with fielding cuz he's an outfielder. Josh was a second baseman. But he wanted to have his hands up high. And I said, "Son, you can't have your hands up high. Jeremy can have his hands up high because we both are natural down cockers. Our hands come down to the launch position. Okay? He said, Dad, I can do it. I, I said, okay, it's your future. I made my money. <laughs> First half of the season, he batted 250-ish. Didn't make the All-Star. You're not going to make an All-Star team batting 250. No. So now we go home for the All-Star break. He wants to listen. Now, I said, uh, you want to get some work in? Yes, sir. I said, you're going to get your hands down where they belong? Yes, sir. (laughs) So the second half, he had to tear it up to bat 300. Not only did he bat 300, he led the league in hits. There you go. Never doubt dad. Oh, yeah. The next season, he he got promoted to high A. He's in Lake Elsinore. Well, we're working out in the offseason. I said, okay, we're going to have an issue with your hands this year. He goes, no, sir. <laughs> so he, he left his hands where they where they are, and and uh, he ended up batting 337 with 128 ribbies with only 16 homers. So he had a ton of doubles, almost 50 doubles, hitting the ball everywhere. In two more years, he was in the big leagues. Wow. So, yeah, no doubt. So, you know, I – it's 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 a little thing. You have great coaches, and uh, you learn a thing or two. And I'm not stupid, so I I figured out a couple of things myself. So, not everybody can style is one thing, but technique is still technique. Not everybody can hit from from or not everyone can stand the same way. But we all hit from the launch position. That's why the major league logo has a baseball in it. Yes. It doesn't sit there and just have the the guy standing there. It has a baseball in it. What that means, I don't care how you start. It would behoove you to have your foot, when you have your foot down, that you be in that position because we all are. It must be such a sense of pride, though, regardless of how far they go, just to know that you know they were able to, to play the game at a professional level. Yes. You know, Jeremy was a, was a late bloomer. And uh, matter of fact, he just had successful knee surgery. Thank God. Knock on wood there. But when he um, started this, he hit 39 homers last year, and uh, including 11 he hit in independent ball before Boston picked him up, like in late May, and he hit like 28 homers with them. And uh, he was off. He had a good spring. He had a few home runs in uh, in spring training. Hit got some big hits for him. I mean, Mookie Best is a right fielder. Good luck there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway, there are the teams out there. Early in the season, he ran into the wall. The wall won, and he wasn't able to firm up his front knee, which is very important. And uh, when when we went to Buffalo, Lloyd and I had a promotion there. We had some autograph signings and what have you. Uh, Devo was telling me, he's, he's one of the coaches there. He said, hey, man, your son's hitting flat-footed. He's not locking out. I said, Devo, between the two of us, he's not healthy. He goes, I knew something was wrong because he has a better swing than that. I said, yeah, he hit the wall about uh, three weeks ago, and he hasn't been the same since. 